45, we'll call this workshop session order. Ms. City Manager. So we have two presentations for you tonight, Council. The first, Chris McGinn will cover our new manager of health and animal services. And this is a new process for animal registrations that we hope would increase uh, the number of, of animals that are registered in the city. Uh, the second is a valet parking ordinance. We want to run this concept before you. We have had a request from the owner of the feed mill, soon to be J2 Steakhouse. For Did you see the sign? No, I haven't seen it. Is the it up? The sign's back. Oh, the feed mill sign. Really? Yes. Very cool. Orange and white. But anyway, so uh, we wanted to discuss uh, the valet parking option with you tonight. So, But we'll start with Chris. City Council, thank you very much for your, your time. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, animal registration. Uh, last year we had about a thousand, uh, 3,000 dogs and cats that were uh, brought into the animal shelter and uh, you know, trying to figure out uh, who these animals belong to can be a, a tedious process. So we're always uh, pushing for registration. So that's one of the reasons why we have uh, registration. Uh, also, uh, with uh, because of the reason that we're the rabies control authority, we're constantly educating the public and pushing the public to understand the importance of having your animal vaccinated, and that that is also one of the whenever we register animals that we make sure the vaccination uh, is current. Um, our city ordinance talks about uh, proof of registration required for each dog, uh, cat, and ferret. Uh, those animals uh, do carry rabies, and so that's the importance of having them registered. Uh, we offer a, a one-year and also a three-year registration, uh, whatever the, uh, the citizen is wanting to do. Uh, current po process for registration, we offer, uh, they can mail in their information, they can come by the, the shelter uh, to register their, their pet. Um, uh, whenever an ACO is out on site, and uh, has a situation with a with a pet owner uh, that's a violation. Uh, we're educating them and, and sometimes require the public to uh, register that animal. Um, who currently registers pets? Uh, we have uh, two staff members during the day that are doing uh, pet registration. Um, about 30% of their day is spent uh, registering uh, uh, pets. Uh, either by mail, uh, by email, uh, and, and going through that process. That was a number that really surprised me, the 30%. So Chris had to kind of walk me through that. So Ethel, you want to talk about why it takes so much time to register? Well, I mean, normally there's a lot of other things going on in the shelter, uh, doing adoptions, uh, customer service, fielding calls uh, with dispatch to the officers in the field. Um, and so, you know, plus the, the length of time it takes to verify the, the documents and enter it all into the computer uh, while you're answering the phone and doing all these other things at the same time. Um, and then uh, all of that stuff then is laser fished uh, as well too. So, you know, plus we get the mail in, the ones that, that are mailed in, so we have to verify that as well too. So all this is going on with everything else. So it, it does take a considerable amount of time for staff to do all that. Mm -hmm. And it may vary throughout the month. Um, like they may be focusing more than 30% at the beginning of the month or depending on, on what the volume is going on. But um, but on average, yeah, 30% during the day. Uh, our current fees, uh, $5 for sterilized animals and $25 for unsterilized because we want to push the fact that it's important to have your animals sterilized. Um, but uh, that $5 fee has been in place for 15 plus years. Um, the current, uh, actually looking at the last uh, three and a half years of animal registrations, uh, started out in uh, fiscal year 13, 14 with uh, over 1,000. Now we're pushing 2,000, so that uh, those numbers are increasing. Um, and we also, uh, 16, 17, we're on track to meet or uh, go above the 2,000 uh, uh, number of registrations. And you know, with that, the revenue is also increasing. Uh, we've had some uh, <clears throat> positive uh, uh, situations come out of uh, water billing, uh, sending out information uh, to to residents about the importance of animal registration. Um, but uh, I think uh, T.J. Gilmore had been to 
a presentation maybe in Plano uh, where they had talked about, you know, what's what's the revenue out there? What can we expect or what 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 could we collect? And so I had uh, run the numbers for uh, City of Louisville looking at the census uh, information, uh, 104,000 residents, and they have a uh, veterinary, the American Veterinary Medical Association has a calculator where they're able to figure out how many cats and dogs per uh, population that might, uh, might be able to include uh, with that size of population. That's about 50,000 uh, cats and dogs in Louisville. Uh, with 88% being sterilized, that means 12% unsterilized. Uh, we're looking at total possible revenue of $480,000 if 100% of the pets in Louisville were registered. Uh, currently, based on last year's revenue uh, of $31,500, that represents 6.5% of the total possible revenue. Uh, most cities strive for 10%. Uh, the gold standard is 20% uh, of, of animals registered. Uh, and so that's just, that's just kind of looking at where we're at, you know, how we're doing, um, and, um, and that we're always looking for ways to be more efficient and offer the citizens other alternatives other than uh, mail or uh, you know, coming to the shelter to, to register their pet. Uh, and looking at the different software companies that um, that can offer the service, uh, pet data is one of is the only, to my knowledge, service that is kind of an all-in-one. They offer the the online uh, submittal uh, of well, they offer multiple different uh, ways of submitting uh, a registration. Uh, one is by mail, which we currently already do. The other is uh, applying online. Um, Another way, which hasn't really caught in and on in Texas yet, is actually um, the registration is done at the veterinarian's office. Um, in Florida, that's kind of a big deal, but in Texas, it's just kind of hasn't really picked up yet. And then, because of the animal services, we we're doing adoptions, and we're also having enforcement activities where we require them to um, have the animal registered. We can still do the registration in house. That information goes back to. Uh, pet data. Um, what's nice about uh, this company is that um, they're sending out notices uh, for renewal and also second notices. Uh, they have a 92% success rate of if the uh, citizen's information is in the system that they're at the end of that year, if they get a one year, that they're able to renew that, that individual the second year. So not only uh, increasing a way that citizens can uh, apply you know, having the option of applying online, but also renewing that information, making it easy, sending reminder information to the citizen to, to renew their pet. Uh, pet data has been uh, in business for 21 years. They've issued more than 9 million uh, pet licenses. So um, they, I think they're in 20 different states in the US. Uh, they offer a 24 hour call center, and that kind of goes above and beyond what we can do at animal services. I mean, we have somebody there that uh, can answer questions uh, during shelter hours, uh, but, but they kind of go above and beyond that, uh, able to give citizens directions on, on how to uh, register uh, during all hours. Um, <coughs> pet, uh, pet data reports, and, and I spoke with a representative of, of pet data, uh, and what they said was that clients on average can expect a 40% increase uh, in registrations after the first year uh, of using their software. Um, pet data is currently in operation in over 67 municipalities in the, um, throughout the 20 states that uh, in the U.S. and then also in this area, Irving, Plano, Frisco, University Park, and Highland Village. Uh, I spoke with uh, Jimmy Cantrell, he's the Director of Animal Services. Uh, basically, they uh, the year before they started using pet data, they, they had uh, had 7,485 registrations uh, in fiscal year 09-10. Um, that following year, they almost uh, doubled with 13,268 registrations. So, um, and I asked him, you know, what were some of the benefits of, of using this software? Where, you know, where did you find, um, what, were some, what were some of the most important things that stuck out in your mind? Uh, 
he said that it, it gave staff uh, additional time to focus on uh, animal welfare activities of the shelter, you know, um, just basic day-to-day -day, uh, operations, which was uh, a huge help for him. Um, he had to figure out, becoming more busy within the shelter, how to be more efficient, and he said that this definitely helped him. It also uh, was an easier way for citizens to, to register their pets without having to find the shelter or having to mail something in or, uh, you know, and, and making it easier for somebody to apply online, you know, you're more likely to get compliance in those areas. Uh, the cost of the program, uh, initial startup fee is $1,000, um, and the $1,000 includes uh, taking the information from our current software and, and pet points, all that registration information and bringing it over to pet data. Um, and they would also set up users uh, to be that could access this information, not only in animal services, but we could make this available to other city employees, uh, like maybe a PD, you know, where they find an animal, they can look up that registration number and, and return that animal without having to take it to the shelter. Um, the fee that Pet Data charges the city is $4.25 um, per registration. Um, our proposed base fee is $7, and I'll talk a little bit later about how we came up with that number. Uh, so basically, we would retain $2.75 for every registration that we do uh, online. The customer would also be charged a $2 uh, convenience fee in addition to the $7. Um, and that would include uh, however animal, many animals are registering at that time. So if they get online and they <clears throat> register three animals, it's still only going to be a $2 online convenience fee. Uh, staff recommendation is, you know, we're, we're excited about this. Um, we see a lot of cities using it and having a lot of positive uh, outcomes by using this software. Um, <coughs> the, the benefits, uh, as I had mentioned, uh, from uh, <clears throat> similar to the city of Plano, is you know to provide staff with additional time to focus on animal uh, welfare activities of the shelter, <clears throat> and also meet, meeting citizens' expectations to offer registration uh, online, you know, with access to a calling service. These would be calls that we'd be receiving at the shelter, um, and and you know taking uh, the registration off of the two <coughs> individuals that that are handling a lot of these registrations and. and focusing on other areas of the shelter would be beneficial for us. And also <clears throat> increasing uh, compliance and in turn revenue. Um, the current fee, as I mentioned, is uh, $5 and then $25 for unsterilized. Our pro proposed fee was $7 and we're asking the unsterilized to be increased to 30 um, And then the three years uh, accordingly to that. Um, the way that we got to that fee was all the cities that were <coughs> charging the fee, we took the average uh, of that and came up with, it was just under seven, so it's, it's right at seven right now. Uh, <coughs> any of these locations here that have a star are cities that are currently participating uh, in using pet data. So, um, I, I, in speaking with Plano, um, Jimmy can't, uh, Jamie Cantrell uh, felt uh, really positive about the software. Uh, that particular shelter has come a long way. Um, and uh, I didn't know if y'all had any questions about uh, anything that we talked about, um, or Claire or Ethel, if you wanted to add anything. I have uh, a question. Uh, sure. So if a person comes in, will the staff handle it, or will you have a computer? Will you kind of direct them to a computer to, to do the... Uh... The discussion has been, uh, we currently have a computer that we can uh, flip that's okay. on a swivel. And, you know, we're going to have those people that just are not going to be comfortable, you know, with the online process. And so that would be an opportunity for us to come around to the other side of the counter and, and assist that individual through the process. But, you know, we would like, you know, the majority of things being done online, if the customer wasn't comfortable with that, uh, we'd be happy to help them, uh, assist them uh, in, the, in that process. Okay. Yes? Mm -hmm. Sure. I have a question. So when I looked at this, as I scrolled down and finally got the proposed fees, I was anticipating that there was some 
um, reason for having a three-year fee, and especially that there would be perhaps some incentive for doing three years um, in lieu of the fact that a lot of things could happen in three years to a pet owner. The pet can pass away, the pet can run away, or the owner could move out of Louisville. So I don't, I don't even know why we're offering this. Why, why would anybody do three years? What, what was the thought process there? Just, just not having necessarily having the ha hassle of coming in and, and renewing every year. Um, there's no incentive. Correct. And so, you know, and, and looking at some cities, some cities don't have an incentive to do a three years. Some do. Um, that could be <clears> something <throat> that we could take a look at. Um, and you know, I go ahead. I, wanted, I think you wanted to add to the, that. The other thing I had to add to that: there is a one-year rabies vaccination and a three-year rabies vaccination. So some people opt to use the three-year vaccination, so they use the the registration concurrent with the rabies vaccination, so they do it all at the same time. And she beat me to that. That's what we do. With our That's right. Okay, I've got a couple questions. So if I'm understanding this correctly, with us only <clears throat> keeping like $2.75, we almost have to double to actually break even with what we're currently getting correct yeah and so like the the new thought is that you know with with the additional water billing mail outs uh, we were able to attribute that we increased increased almost 250 registrations just by doing one mail out <clears throat> so the thought is um, yes we would increase our registrations um, based on uh, pet data starting up in the in in these other cities they're saying on average it's been about 40% increase. Uh, so we're hoping that that increase in the amount of registrations we're able to offset uh, the, the hit that we're taking in because we would no longer be collecting the $5, we'd be collecting the $2.75. And like I said, it looks like we almost need to double what we're currently doing just to break even financially, but then the citizens paying not only the extra money, but the $2 convenience fee on top of it. Right. And so, so they're almost doubling what their cost is. What we what we have to be careful about is is looking at the survey cities and looking at the fees that's, that that uh, that were being charged, and uh, you know, ten dollars was was most likely the, um, I think the highest. There might have been one that was in there that was twelve. And so, looking at that, uh, we're, we're thinking that uh, seven is is a pretty good uh, fit. But it's with seven one. with the two, so it'll be nine. Correct. For the yeah. online, yeah. Now, the next question I have is similar to the three-year, and this is me personally. I, why don't we do an average dog last 12 years? That would be four three-year periods, you know, which would be $60. Give me a break at 50 bucks. I'd rather pay it and never have to worry about it again. I mean, could that be? Oh, seriously! I mean, because yeah, no, like my guess is most, and I'm just guessing. I have no nothing to back this up. That a lot of people, they're happy. They got a new dog. They do everything. They register it, and then three years later, they're like, you know, this dog eats me out of house and home. I'm not gonna, you know, go register it. That initial excitement on the first time registration, then three years later. How many people? I, I don't know that, but I mean, and I, I is the renewal that strong versus the initial impact of when they get their first little pet? Well, I don't know. Like, what percentage would you say ethical of people out there that are actually doing the three year as opposed to the one year? I mean, do we have a lot of folks coming in? Not a whole lot that do the three year. Maybe ten percent, ten or twenty percent. It's it's pretty minimal. Uh, like today, we had one that that actually, it's the first time I've ever had this, and it was ironic that it was today, but they called and they had a cat, and they registered it for three years, but the cat passed away, so they have a new cat, and they wanted to see if they could get a two-year credit from the And, and so the question is, would we refund? Would we, you know, we well, I think we can kind of think, you know, hey, you don't, but there has to be, like Neil was saying, there has to be some type of benefit. Mm -hmm. If it's the same price for one year, is but if you'd give me a, you know, 20% break, I'll pay it one time, be done, and never have to mess with it again. Yeah. One thing I like about this program is it makes uh, the annual registration, which to me is the best, because uh, if you move uh, or your pet dies, you can take that into account. Sometimes you're going to forget that you pay three years of your pet passes, but the more the more important thing is you move. Again, this the issue here is that we have animals that are 
uh, that we have the proper address on and they have their proper vaccinations. And so that annual renewal to me makes a whole lot of sense to meet our true goals. I mean, that obviously revenue is always important to us uh, to cover the cost. But the more important thing is that you get these animals registered uh, and remind people that they need to get their vaccinations. And I think you have to have the vaccination. You have to send that in yes, to get. So That's it's easy. Correct. When you're doing a three-year right. rabies, it's just easier. I think I'm one year, one and a half of my dogs now. Yeah. So. And, and what I like about the program, it sends you a renewal. So it reminds you. So you might forget. That's what happens now. I go in, I've got my new dog, I'm all excited, and I pay my registration fee, and then I forget. <clears throat> So this is an automatic reminder that staff's not having to touch. So when you start computing that additional workload that's Absolutely. taken, that's, we don't, that's we don't pretty significant. We don't remind now. So that's pretty significant. So my thought is really your annual, I don't know if you want to encourage longer because I think it's not as effective. I mean, well, and the, the rabies is a state law requirement that they be vaccinated against rabies. It's a class C misdemeanor if you don't vaccinate your animal for rabies. So if you're not verifying that, at least on a three year, like the state requires is the, the maximum. Um, and so if they do the lifetime of the pet, there's no way you know to verify that those animals are being vaccinated. And, but right now, what, 94% of our pets aren't registered anyway, so how do we verify that they're? We don't. It's call by call basis. <clears throat> Again, you know, this, this gets a few more animals registered, and you make sure those animals have their proper vaccinations. It's not ever going to be 100%, but at least it gets us closer. And ultimately, you know, not only uh, checking up on vaccinations, we want to be able to get that pet back to that owner and hopefully not even having to bring them into shelter. Um, you know, we want to have the correct address. If, if, if we're checking on an address every year, we have a greater chance of finding out where that individual is. This doesn't tie in with the chip at all, does it? Does not. Yeah, that, that was the one thing that to me was a little problematic. So, so what an option? Uh, so if, if Basically, if they're registered, they would be they would have the option to come into the shelter and, and have the dog microchip. There is an additional charge for that. What is the current? It's charge? fifteen dollars for microchip. Does so, this database tie into the chip database? It, it does not. It, it ties into pet points, okay. um, and and I'm actually I'm not 100 percent sure of that because they're they're pulling all the information from pet point, which is what we're using. So they may be able to pull that chip information. That's something that I'd have to check on, but th it is a possibility. It seems like it'd be worth it. I do know that they're able to pull all the registration information from our current software. So I don't know. Find out about that. So council, normally we just change our fees annually at the budget budget time. But because of this program and what it might bring as far as getting additional animals registered, we're bringing it to you mid-year. So if you're supportive of the fees as proposed, we bring back an ordinance for you. So, so I have a question. Um, what's my process for not being charged the convenience fee? If you want to mail in your information to pet data, you can get around having to pay that $2. Okay. I just I didn't so, see any mechanism you there. Come in the shelter and do it as okay. well. And I, and I, I, I what exactly. I didn't want to see was, well, it's a convenience fee. You, you got to pay it. And and so if there's no mechanism for getting around it, then why do you have a convenience fee? Because everybody's got to pay it. Mm -hmm. They could so, they could they could mail that into pet data. They could mail that into the shelter. I mean, we can still. I mean, we're still going to help somebody through the process without having to charge the the two dollar convenience fee. I mean, overall, I like the program. I think there are some questions raised. I'd like to see the answers on that before finally bringing this back to the yeah. council for a To me, to me, so it's I can, all the same so I can clarify, I'm sorry. Clarify. So the question was about the um, about the chip and tying in. Is that what we There there's was there? one of several. Okay. So I'm, I'm speaking for the table at large. Okay. Yeah. So the other question, is there, a, a, is there an interest <clears throat> in trying to do some incentive program to make for, to encourage longer periods of registration? Yeah, I think for me, I mean, I'm okay. It's just was not understanding why, the why it was the same. I mean, what, why there was no financial. For me, I still do a three-year um, 
rabies shot, but I probably register annually, particularly with two dogs that are uh, within two years probably of their normal lifespan. Why would I go to a three year registration? There's exactly. No, there's no benefit. I like that it's notifying people. I think that, that's, that's the biggest hole we have right now, and I know it we is. don't have the bandwidth to, to go do that. So. <laughs> so, really, the only question I have on my list is the chip. Am I missing something else that, you want, that someone want to follow up on? Okay. Then I have the chip question. Chip question, okay. So when we bring this back for the ordinance for your consideration, we'll have that answer for you in the back of it. And it's not a make or break answer, it's just that now's the time to find out. Yeah, it absolutely is. Good question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now Claire is going to talk about the uh, valet parking ordinance. Okay, so um, we've gotten to the point now in our um, urban growth that we are considering a valet ordinance. Um, so uh, the demand for valet parking, we haven't had a ton, but we did have uh, Jim Murray from the Feed Mill contact us specifically. Um, and really what we're focusing on is a demand for valet potentially in our old town area. Um, and particularly for restaurants. The reason restaurants are of um, particular concern is because of the seating capacity. And although we don't have uh, parking requirements in our core of downtown, um, restaurants do have a higher parking um, requirement elsewhere than a lot of other uses. And so that's why we're here today to talk about it specifically with restaurants. Next slide. The first thing that I was tasked with doing was researching what other regulatory programs were out there. And these are the folks that I looked at was Dallas, Fort Worth, McKinney, Plano, and Austin. Um, and all of them basically have the same regulatory structure, which is um, if you're going to use our right of way, you're going to submit a, a, a permit application. Um, and we will give you the right to use our right of way by, um, by license or by permit. And um, they were year to year. So obviously, whenever we are going to be looking at valet parking, there are some immediate considerations that we need to think about from a public uh, standpoint, a city standpoint. Obviously, we've got the use of public property, uh, which would be for the drop-off and pick, potentially for the drop-off and pick-up spots, parking, and maneuvering. Um, so all of these could be, be in the public uh, realm. And then there's liability issues. Obviously, there's indemnification that we would want to get if they're going to be using our spots and operating a business in, in the right of way, as well as insurance. And obviously, we want protection of citizens and visitors. Um, there, I, I wanted to note that there will be an exception. We, we currently have a special events ordinance that allows people, when you have special events, to have valley parking. We don't want to touch that with this ordinance. It's working just fine. Um, as well as for any city or city-sponsored events. So if we have Western Days or we have any other events that are like that, if the, if the city is sponsoring it, that means our engineering department, our traffic engineer is already looking at these or considering all these options. It's not like a third party who doesn't have that interest in mind. So with the authorization, we wanted to start really small. Um, we don't want to have this we want to take baby steps with this as staff. That's our recommendation. And so what we wanted to do is focus, this is our recommendation, is focusing on the Old Town Design District. So that's this entire area in yellow here. And between 5 p.m. and 2 a.m. So um, really we're talking about the daytime <coughs> rush, rush. And when operated in conjunction with a restaurant use. So it, it's, like I said, the reason for that is because restaurants have a higher demand for um, parking, people, people stay in restaurants longer, so you'll have more overlap of patrons. And by permit only, and we'll go through the permit process. So long as the, um, the applicant has the ability to designate three parallel parking spaces for valet queuing. So this is from um, talking with our engineering department. We're thinking, and from our traffic engineer standpoint, three parallel parking spots make sense to us um, from a safety standpoint because of queuing of, of the vehicles. And then, um, the other thing to realize is head-in parking, because, I mean, obviously there's head-in parking in Old Town as well. With head-in parking, there's a problem with, to be able to have the same amount of space, you're going to be taking up a significant number of more parking spots in Old Town, and we already have parking concerns from our, from our uh, restaurants down here, not restaurants, but all businesses down here. Um, so we really wanted to focus on the parallel parking spaces, because it takes up, to actually get that queuing space, you take up fewer parking spots. 
And so long as the valley queuing is not, and I pulled these standards um, from, I believe it was Fort Worth. So located in a street <coughs> segment directly adjacent to a sing single family residential use. You don't want to have, um, you know, queuing of a, in front of a single family. I think you guys would get some complaints. Um, within 10 feet of a crosswalk for safety purposes, within 10 feet of a fire hydrant, fire call box, police or other emergency facility, within five feet of a driveway, within three feet in front or 15 feet behind a sign marking a designated bus stop. So these all make sense um, from a traffic standpoint and it gives a very objective standard for our staff to apply. So this is a lot of information. I'm not going to read through all of it, but you can see there's, you know, we're going to want to know the telephone number of designated agents at restaurants. Next, don't go ahead and advance it. The things that I think are a very, of great importance here is we're going to require an applicant with who would be the restaurant operator to submit a valet site map showing proposed valet station, queuing area, driving routes, designated parking area, traffic control devices, and we can list anything else that we think is relevant from, a, from an engineering traffic safety point of view um, in that list in our ordinance. The basic idea is they submit their application, they've got their plan, and then you've got your en our traffic engineer will scrutinize each on a case-by-case -case basis to make sure that there's no issues with um, creating a traffic <coughs> or safety concern for our public. Next. Also, disclosure of Louisville's Valley parking permits issued and or revoked within the last three years. So one of the provisions we'll put in there is if you've had a, if you've had a Valley permit revoked for any reason within the last three years, actually, Revoked, for, yeah, within the last three years, you wouldn't be able to come and be have another valley. So if you're a valley parking permit, so the idea is if you're a bad actor or something, you know, you're not, you, you've you've been negligent in how you've been operating your stand, we can not give you that permit <coughs> for the next time. Yes, sir. So I got a question. Let's say that it's the restaurant and they have a and most likely they're going to outsource it to another company. So Acme Valet does a bad job and their license is revoked, but then, you know, they want to hire ABC Valet, even though it's the same restaurant. Yes, is actually, the restaurant right. negated so, or is it just the Valet company? So we're having them no notify us of what it is and then we will look at the, at the <coughs> revocation to see was it an issue with the tenant or with the contractor or was it an issue with the restaurant? But I know what you're saying because I actually hesitated when I started saying that because I, you know, you don't want to blame someone and, and prevent them from doing that. I mean, my guess is all of them will probably use a third party. Yes, I agree with that. Um, the other thing to think about is what if the feed mill does not, you know, feed mill has a certain act, bad actor as their contractor and they hire someone else who's a good one, right? Well, then that new one comes to Twisted Root to be, well, we know we're not going to get, uh, Twisted Root's not going to get a valley permit parking if they're using that contractor that had, was negligent previously. And we had to, or we revoked it. Um, next one. And then evidence of a written contract between the applicant and operator of any private parking facility where they propose, the proposed parking, they propose parking vehicles. So this is basically, if you're going to use another, if you're going to use a private parking lot, let's say I've um, decided I'm going to use a church parking lot, for, the feed mill is going to use um, a church parking lot, and you know obviously there's not going to be a lot of overlap with you know two to five or five to two a.m. versus a, all they have to do is show that they have an agreement with the church, and then they have to sh have, provide evidence that there's not going to be open, that, that basically that parking structure can facilitate the use for both. So they won't be using public streets to park? Because I see that a lot in Dallas where they kind of cone off certain spots. Right. So our, our thought right now is that for queuing, they can reserve the three spots for queuing. We don't want to have any reserved parking right now. So it's a first come, first serve. Um, now that may prove, once we get it in there and we start doing it, it may prove to be unmanageable, that they need to have a parking lot. We can address that and bring it back to you guys if there's an issue. Right now, um, staff is concerned about porting off parking spaces in our, you know, in our downtown area where, you know, where you guys are already getting. I would be against that. Yes. So we are not recommending that. Okay, next. 
So the application process. So the application will be approved within 10 business days by the engineering department if the engineering department finds, and these are the things they're going to look at. The proposed valley operation will not unreasonably interfere with vehicular pedestrian traffic. The applicant and or the proposed valet service provider will not violate any have not violated any conditions of the previous or existing valet permit within the past three years. The proposed valet parking operation will not endanger the safety of any person. And the proposed valet parking operation is permitted under the adopted valet parking ordinance. So that, that goes to all the, the requirements early on. You're in Old Town, it's between this time, um, these times, et cetera, et cetera. And then we can always put conditions on the valley permit if needed to protect the public health, safety, and welfare and to mitigate traffic impacts. Next. So operating standards, again, I'm not going to go through this, but this is really, this is the meat of a lot of the ordinances that we saw out there. Go to, go to the next one. So um, some of the ones I thought were particularly of importance was uh, maintaining a minimum pedestrian passing clearance of four feet. Um, to us, that's really important, especially from an ADA perspective. Next. No vehicle may stop or stand at a drop-off or loading area for longer than five minutes. And so this, again, is for traffic concerns. Um, we don't want to have a uh, backup of vehicles into our right-of-way. Next. And valley services must be complementary of using uh, city right-of-way for queuing locations. So the reason why this is this is there is, you know, you can have complementary services where you just have to tip the person for the service. We don't want um, our, for, if we're using public land, the idea is, is someone going to make a profit off of using public land? Um, and so our thought process at this point was not to, to basically say it has to be complementary if you're using our, our right of way for the queuing. And that closing operator has to lock the vehicles and deposit the key with the restaurant. And if the vehicle is left for more than 48 hours, operator has to notify the police department. That being to make sure that it's not a stolen vehicle. Next. So reasons for revocation. I think, let's see if it goes forward or not. Okay. So, you know, negligently or intentionally fails to make proper provisions for safeguarding of vehicles left in their custody. That's if some, you know, if someone... If I, I park the car, I'm a valley parker, and I leave the door wide open and you know, walk off when someone steals the car, and there's some evidence as to that. Operator fails to comply with the valley parking permit or any federal, state, or local laws. Um, if I'm not parking where I told them I was going to be parking, and I'm parking you know, along the street and creating a traffic hazard. Um, if, you give your car, if you negligently or knowingly give a vehicle to someone who's not the owner or operator. Um, material misrepresentation on the application, lapse of insurance, and then this is this is the to me um, the meat of this is once we they get in there and they start operating, if it really is creating a problem traffic-wise, you know, um, or if it's blocking a fire hydrant that we didn't realize it was blocking the fire hydrant, we're not tied in for an entire year, so we can revoke it at that point. Go to the next one. The other thing I wanted to, before we go to questions and direction on this, I wanted to make sure that you realized is obviously if we're revoking permits um, or if we are um, denying permits, we'll have some type of appeal process that will work into the ordinance as well. So that appeal, and that's common across the board, so that appeal could be to the city manager, it could be to council. Um, I'd be interested to see which one you guys would prefer, um, but we will write in a uh, appeal process as well. So questions and directions. I'll go ahead and state a preference. We've already had considerable discussion about trying to move um, lesser, you know, not items that are not high ranking down from council to staff level. So I would, my recommendation on that is if the, the appeal process first be handled through staff and then if they want a second appeal, then they could bring it to council, but not their first not appeal. I've got a question, <clears throat> and I know special events are out, so if somebody's having a big event at Hilton Garden Inn, it doesn't matter that it's a one-time thing and everything. But what if, because it basically states restaurants, so what if the hospital, you know, and a lot of hospitals have valet parking that they decided to do, and they're within that zone that was designated, <clears throat> what happens to them because they're outside of this ordinance? Right, so currently, if they... Um if it's a valet parking ordinance and they're on and they're using public, 
right of way, then this would be triggered. But if there's, like, let's say they pick, they have a drop off at their location, but they but then they ballet to and another totally parking lot that's only really private. This does not apply. Okay. Okay. This is really only when there's maneuvering or parking on public right of way. Okay. Looks good. Okay. All right, we'll be bringing this back to you in the form of an, an ordinance for your consideration. Police Week and for National Drinking Water and Public Works Week. Yep. Proclamations. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Just need proclamations. And then I have a presentation for Teen Court. Is Judge Judge Fox going to be here? All right. Let's go ahead and uh, public hearing. Consideration of an ordinance granting special use permit. Public hearing number two. Questions, comments. This one, where's Richard? Right here. Oh, there you are. Uh, so this one looks a little different because you see that we have a lot of variances that are listed and then we're recommending that we have some time to look uh, further into this. You know, we've talked about how our development code is somewhat antiquated. So when you start dealing with planned developments, you start running into issues. And that's really what we're struggling with a little bit here. So I'm going to have Richard walk you through some of these issues. Yes, uh, <coughs> this item is uh, truly unique. It's kind of a hybrid. Uh, you can kind of, it has uh, attributes that resemble single family, but it also has attributes that uh, resemble multifamily. And that's truly what the plan development process is for, is to kind of customize your, your zoning for a particular site, for a particular use. And uh, as we customarily do, we usually bundle any variances to our general development ordinance to these PDs. And we uh, initially identified five uh, variance requests uh, that was associated with this development. And as we were kind of finalizing uh, the item, um, we uh, staff internally kind of realized that this one's really different. We're going to need to take another look at it because it's not straight single family, nor is it completely multifamily. So uh, these are uh, four of these uh, various requests are kind of engineering related to the street design, street layout. Um, those are the four that we're asking um, to, um, that the council not take any action on tonight. We about to further investigate to see how this um, interacts with uh, the General Development Ordinance and uh, we'll address these issues at the time of planning uh, of the project. Uh, we have no objection with the concept. We think it's really, really innovative and would be a great asset to the city of Louisville. Um, that leaves item number C and that is one that uh, we would like for you to act on and that is a variance to the exterior finish requirements for the development. Um, they're, they're really uh, proposing a very unique uh, design and character for the architecture. Um, it will have some uh, exposure from the perimeter streets, and so um, we had asked the uh, applicant to consider, you know, a um, pretty high percentage of masonry on the rear and sides that will be visible from, from the outside, but uh, allow them some creativity for the architecture on the fronts, which, you know, are basically internal. And they're going more with the... Uh, 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 Craftsman's dollar box of architecture. Um, Randy Rivera with GNA um, Consultants is with us tonight. She has a very brief presentation to kind of walk you through the development since it is so different. So if there are no questions, uh, I think I'd turn it over to, to Randy. Thank you, Richard. Good evening, Randy Rivera. Um, property is 10.123 acres. Uh, Rock Brook, here to our east, East Hubert and South Hubert, and then Round River Road, 34 down here to the south. Um, go to the next, please. Um, here is the concept plan that is attached to the PD. 
Of the 10.1 acres, we have 66 residential units, and the different shades on the units represent different sizes um, of, of them. And then the idea is that all 10 acres will remain as one lot. The main entrance into the development is from Rockbrook. It is a divided entrance that's gated, um, so the entire development will be secured um, with that gated entrance and then a secondary emergency access point here. Um, and so in the 2025 plan, it talks about this area being a, you know, a thriving neighbor neighborhood. So how do we achieve that? And uh, diversity in housing and different housing options um, is, is a way to fulfill the, or the requirements of the, the 2025. And so by providing for this 66 unit age restricted development that has to have at least one of the uh, residents be um, 55 years and older. Uh, most of the, unit, the units will be uh, single story. There are options for second stories with the um, grandparents want maybe to have a game room, you know, or a story and a half. The kids, grandkids go upstairs and play. Um, again, the, the de this type of demographic that this is trying to attract, that will attract, um, they're very social. They want a lot of interaction with each other. Um, and so front porches were very important to allow them to get out onto the front and you know, look at you know, who's going up and down the street, what's saying hi to their neighbor, um, and to promote that social uh, environment. There's also an amenity center here in the center. We try to locate that in a central area with a pool. And then that there's a trail around the entire perimeter. Um, it's about 2,400 linear feet of walking trail for them. Um, so you can walk along the streets. These are the streets here. You'll have the sidewalks on either side. Um, but you can also walk in uh, the, on the, along the perimeter as well. Um, again, this is the reason this is unique is because it is, like I said, we're getting one lot, and each owner will have uh, one 66 uh, ownership in the property, and so they pay into the HOA based on um, that percentage of ownership, and their fees will go to everything to maintain the perimeter fencing, the trails, the amenity center the pool, maintain all the landscaping, even the exteriors of their homes. So that way they can, all, they, all they're responsible for is the interior and ma maintain um, the inside. And so that promotes a, a lock and leave, I'll go back one, a lock and leave lifestyle so that they could you know, travel for long periods of time, go see their grandkids and, and do things like that. Um, and then the HOA is maintaining the exteriors and um, uh, the grounds. Again, the private street. So the street is, it meets the same street section as the city's required residential street, but it is going to be in an access easement. So that's kind of why Richard was talking about it being unique. And I know in another city, they inspect uh, the, um, the street or the access easement based on multifamily um, inspections, and then they inspect the homes based on single family inspections. So they had to do a, a hybrid. Um, to the inspection uh, policy that they have to do. Um, go ahead and go to the next one. Um, the architecture uh, is an American craftsman style. This is a unique style because it's, uh, it, 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 the front porch is sort of the central tenet to the craftsman style. And then the tapered columns, um, and then dormers, you know, on the roof elements, and um, enhanced garage doors. And all of those things are put in the PD that um, you know, the, the, the buildings, when you come in, you have to meet, you know, two out of the five elements in order to be uh, craftsmen. And uh, what we have, 60%, I think, of each facade has to be um, the brick veneer, except for the front. And the front is because of the garage um, and the porch element. Go ahead and go to the next one. Here is the landscape plan. The orange is showing the trail. The green is the shade trees. And then the... The pink is the, uh, the ornamental trees along the streets and stuff. So we do try to spread out um, the trees. What was important when we started designing this early on is that tower over in the southeast corner. It's huge. And so we wanted to really not have any homes backing up to it, but for, you know, separating them and creating a buffer and you know, kind of clustering some trees down in this corner and then along this side to really to, to help try to screen that tower. This is the street section that we're using. It really is an access easement. Um, again, you can see it meets the city standard. And then this is a blow up of the three different <coughs> unit types. Um, the garages will be set back at least uh, 18, sorry, did I do that? That's okay. uh, 18 feet from uh, the front so that uh, there, at least one car can be parked in the driveway without blocking the sidewalk. And we have a 10 foot front yard setback. The porches will be obviously in here. Um, six feet between the units. 
um, and then I think there's a 10 foot separation uh, when units back up to each other. And then this is the uh, subdivision entry sign that will be located at, along at Rockbrook at the main entrance in the median with enhanced landscaping um, in it as well. So if there's any questions? No. No. Um, oh, actually, one question. They, they asked for a uh, reduction in the uh, treatment. That's our 80%? 80% down and to 60. And they went down to 60. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that would be the only variance for your consideration tonight, but very likely we'll be bringing back these issues at a later time when we figure out exactly what our recommendation needs to be. And so the problem is being able to individually address the homes on an access easement. So how do you do that? So there, there are issues that uh, we really need to look at the development ordinance and, and get our hands around. Other questions? Nope. Okay. Moving on, item three. <laughs> a fire station, a new location off of uh, 3040. Item four. This item's really more of a cleanup and a clarification for your special use permit process. All right. Move to the consent agenda. Item five. Item six. I saw this at your last meeting. You remember that uh, DCTA had uh, requested a change in the contract, and so we're bringing it back to you now for final approval. Item seven. So Carolyn's here tonight, and I want her to talk a little bit about uh, what this digital uh, resource brings to the library. Um. Thank you for having me. Because this interlocal agreement was uh, created in order to give us access to more copies and titles beyond um, the digital collection that the city of Louisville offers. So we, we would, under this interlocal agreement, still be able to purchase uh, the content that we think the city of Louisville would like. But then beyond that, we would have access to um, the items and titles that the other libraries that are participating would be purchasing. So we would be able to serve the city of Louisville first by purchasing what we think is of interest here. Um, our patrons would be able to uh, be the only ones who would be able to request those items and have them on hold. But if they were sitting on the shelf getting dusty, as you may, you may call it a physical book, um, they would then be able to be checked out by those other, other libraries. So right now we have a little less than 4,000 titles available or items available in our digital collection. And this would give us access to <clears throat> about 32,000 items um, with these 11 libraries that are going in together. And we have interest from three other libraries at this point beyond that. <coughs> yeah, Bear County would bring how many more titles? Bear County is a digital library. They have 40,000 items on their own. Um, we also have interest from Fort Bend County and the City of Hearst at this yeah. point. This expands your your digital library, I think, exponentially. So it's a great uh, program for a thousand dollars. Very minimal. And because Carolyn's been kind of on the ground floor, we don't even pay the thousand for the first year. So she's done a really good job on this. As a user of the old traditional interlibrary loan program, that I know we're not allowed to talk about it uh -huh. in that, but yeah, great move. I'm glad they digital folks figured that out. All right. Item 8. Item 8 is a little bit of a problem. When we're awarding a bid that's close to half a million, we usually like to see a number of bidders. This one, we worked hard and to try to expand that base, and we still were only able to get one bidder. Uh, Keith can probably explain that in more detail than I can. Keith. Yeah, so this is the manual rehabilitation in the CDBG area, and essentially the, the types of, of rehab are varied. There's anything from rebuilding the entire manhole, and we actually have some large manholes in here uh, that will be rebuilt, to just replacing the ring and cover, to uh, adjusting the grade, to in some cases it's uh, spraying a, a, an epoxy coating on the inside of the manhole. And, 
And so there are several things that we're trying to accomplish, but the, the issue is that the, the scope of work was fairly broad, and so we, we had some contractors that had talked about, well, we would have bid if you had broken it up into two or three different types, and then we could bid one type of work. The problem with that is control of the contractors, the, the overlap of mobilization costs, and that sort of thing. So this one contractor that's capable of all of these methods uh, and was available, that's the other issue, is some of the other contractors in the area are just not interested in, uh, unfortunately, a, a half a million dollar project. It's just not large enough for them to, to, to pay. So, uh, you know, we reached out to several during the course of the bid, and then we reached out to them afterwards to find out why they didn't bid. And, and uh, uh, you know, at the, at the end of the day, the best uh, thing for the city is to move forward with this contractor. It is a good contractor. Uh, they are capable of doing the work. Uh, the pricing is not bad pricing. It's just that we don't have a basis of comparison. Like Donna said, we don't have several bids to compare. So. And time is of the essence here. This is CDBG funding, so it has to, it needs to move forward. Other questions? I have nine. Bed Bath & Beyond, this is an amendment to your agreement. The current ED agreement requires them uh, to utilize 100% of the facility. This would back off and allow them some flexibility in their space, uh, up to 10% for a seven-year period. I have looked uh, pretty carefully at their sales tax that's being generated at this facility, and it far exceeds uh, what was estimated in the original agreement. Uh, for that reason, I'm pretty comfortable with allowing the 90%. <coughs> Anything else on nine? Item 10. Item 11. Item 12. I don't have any issue with that one. Item 13. Thoughts on these? And we are done with the agenda. Any questions or comments before we close the workshop? Close. We'll see you at seven. It is 7 p.m. I call this meeting of the Louisville City Council to order, and a quorum <coughs> is present. First up, we have an invocation with Councilman Jones. Please rise for a moment of silence. <coughs> Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. <coughs> Councilman Jones, we have a couple of proclamations. We sure do. Whereas there are approximately 900,000 law enforcement officers serving in communities across the United States, including the dedicated members of the Louisville Police Department, and whereas, since the first recorded death in 1791, more than 20,000 law enforcement officers in the United States have made their ultimate sacrifice and been killed in the line of duty. 
whereas the names of these dedicated public servants are engraved on the walls of the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial in Washington, D.C., and whereas 394 new names of fallen heroes are being added to the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial this spring, including 143 officers killed in 2006, 2016, and 251 officers killed in previous years. And whereas May 15th is designated as Peace Officers Memorial Day in honor of the falling officers and their families, and the U.S. flags should be flown at half staff. Now, therefore, Rudy Durham, Mayor of City of Louisville, do hereby proclaim the week of May 14th through May 20th, 2017 as National Police Week and May 15th as Police Memorial Day. Thank you. And thank you all for your service. Our next, our next proclamation will be with David Evans and us and the city staff. You guys come on down. Start our own football team with this group. Right. All right, let's keep rolling. Whereas water is a basic and essential need of all humankind and all living things to sustain life, whereas water is a limited resource that should be used wisely, and water supply is protected by preventing pollution and conserving water, and whereas public works and utilities provide essential services needed for the protection of health and welfare of our community as part of their everyday lives, and whereas the support of a satisfied and informed citizenry is vital to the professional operation of the public works utility system and essential programs such as water production and distribution, wastewater treatment and collection, environmental services, streets and storm drainage, traffic and fleet operations in public buildings and facilities. And whereas quality and capability of these facilities as well as their planning, design and construction is vitally dependent upon their efforts and skills of the public services employees. And whereas the efficiency of the qualified and committed personnel who staff the public services department is significantly influenced by citizen attitudes and appreciation of the important work they perform. Now, therefore, Rudy Durham, Mayor of the City of Louisville, and on behalf of the Louisville City Council, do hereby proclaim the week of May 7th through 13th, 2017, National Drinking Water <clears throat> Week, and May 21st through 27th, National Public Works Week and urge all citizens and civic organizations to understand and recognize the contributions of the Public Services Department in providing for our daily utility needs and protecting the health, safety, and well-being of our community. Thank you, gentlemen. Does anyone want to step forward? Um, on, be on behalf of uh, Public Services, we, uh, we just want to show our, our uh, gratitude and, and thank you all for uh, allowing us to be a part of this event and to be a part of this city. And um, we, uh, we love what we do and we love serving the citizens. and. Um, the families and the employees, and um, we couldn't do our job without y'all's support, and we thank y'all for, for everything you do for public services. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. All right. Next, I'd like to welcome up uh, Judge Holly Fox uh, to uh, give some certificates of appreciation for some pretty outstanding kids. Thank you. <clears throat> We'd like to honor the 2017 uh, graduating teen court volunteers, uh, first with certificates of appreciation. If y'all would come on up, I'm uh, Ann Loney and Summer uh, Jaber. Um, the, there's also one other who could not be here tonight, Jay Yoon. Um, these young people have given a significant amount of their time, uh, their energy, and their talents to serve not only as attorneys, as bailiffs, as jurors, uh, even as master judges uh, in the teen court process. They give up their family time, they give up some of their study time, and they are very uh, involved in the teen court uh, process. So we would like to recognize each of you by giving you a certificate of appreciation, which I believe has been handed to you, if you want to open that up. I think they want to see that and we'd like to just thank you um, because each of you have spent a significant amount of time within the last at least four to five years uh, off and on 
And so your um, time and uh, energy spent within the Teen Corp program is uh, deeply appreciated. So I'd like to thank you for that. Um, also, uh, each year, the City of Louisville uh, Teen Court uh, program honors one individual uh, with a monetary scholarship of $1,000. And um, this year, this scholarship, uh, it exemplifies, um, they're both, we always have great candidates, and we've had quite a few, actually, to choose from, and it's really hard making that decision. But the key thing we looked at was consistent commitment, uh, and um, you came every week, um, very responsible. Um, you had a, uh, you definitely um, <coughs> believed in the process. You grew through the process. We got to see you um, achieve uh, success as well through, through the program. And we would like to recognize Ann Loney, uh, known as Anastasia Loney, uh, with the $1,000 uh, scholarship. And uh, she is a homeschooled student in the community. She resides in Louisville, Texas. She has uh, served as a volunteer for our program for over five years. Uh, you have served in the capacity of master jury judge, uh, bailiff, um, uh, prosecuting attorney, defense attorney. Essentially, when you show up, you're, what can I do? What role am I playing today? Um, so we appreciate that. You, um, you indicate, I believe you said to Ms. Uh, Everett, that your participation in the teen court process has uh, allowed you to demonstrate a strong commitment uh, and responsibility uh, to a program being the teen court program. And that particular program has taught you very valuable lessons in confidence, uh, responsibility, leadership, and compassion. And uh, I believe you were quoted as saying, being able to see someone beyond their mistakes and treating them with kindness is the most invaluable way that teen court has changed who you are. And I think that's awesome. So um, you will be attending North Central Texas College in the fall uh, to study speech, language, and pathology, and I think with further studies in uh, speech therapy, and that your specific studies will be in pediatrics. So, uh, and I'm not sure, where are you going to school? UT Austin, you're headed down south to Austin. And what are you gonna be studying? Public health. Public health. So we have two young ladies who have exemplified incredible amount of dedication and commitment to the teen court process, which changes young people's lives. And uh, we thank you uh, for your time and commitment. <laughs> and I'd like to recognize uh, Ms. Everett, uh, she has you basically run the program. Uh, you deal with each person and candidate for the teen court program. You process whether or not they are a good candidate. Uh, you work with them, making sure they stay on task, turn in their community service hours, um, do their programs. You're in the process of finding alternative means of community service because it is hard to find community service for younger people without uh, needing supervision. Some people, some particular providers um, want their parents there and that's not always possible. So. I also want to appreciate, uh, thank you for your commitment and your time uh, that you give way beyond, I'm sure, what you get paid for to the Teen Court program. So I appreciate that. Hearings. Public hearing number public hearing number one. Consideration of an ordinance granting a special use permit for an expansion of an auto body shop on 1.662 acres <coughs> located at 999 East State Highway 121 Business. The SUP provides enhanced features to the new build to new to the new buildings. The replacement of an existing pole sign with a monument sign and the addition of nine trees on the site. PNC recommended approval by a vote of seven to zero. 
The recommendation is that the City Council approve the ordinance with the condition that the existing pole sign be removed and replaced with a six-foot-tall monument sign. All right. I have no public comment cards. Any comments or questions? I'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Move to close. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor of closing the public hearing, signify by saying aye. 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 Public hearing is now closed. I'll entertain a motion to approve. Move to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve. Does that include the uh, monument sign? I will amend the motion. Uh, move to approve the ordinance with the uh, additional caveat that the pole be taken down, removed, and replaced with a six foot monument sign. Councilman Daniels, you second that? Second. All right. This is an ordinance of the Louisville City Council amending the zoning ordinance by granting a special use permit for the expansion of an auto body shop on a 1.662 acre lot legally described as Lot 1R Block A, BK Drilling Edition, located on the north side of East State Highway 121 Business, approximately 1,170 feet east of Valley Ridge Boulevard at 999 State Highway 121 Business and Zone Light Industrial District, providing for repealer severability and a penalty and declaring an emergency. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Motion passes. Public hearing number two. Public hearing, consideration of an ordinance granting a zone change request from Agricultural Open Space District and Light Industrial District to Plan Development Mixed Use District and five associated variances on 10.123 acres located on the southwest corner of Rockbook Drive and East Euchre Lane. The proposed development is an age-restricted community for seniors. Five variances are requested. A. To allow private streets. B. To waive the alley rear entry requirement. C. To allow a reduction in the exterior finish requirement. D. To allow a reduction in the clear vision area. And E. To allow a reduction in the required corner clip. Variance requests A, B, D, and E will be addressed at the time of preliminary plat. PNC recommended approval by a vote of 7 to 0. The recommendation is that the City Council approve the ordinance, take no action on variances A, B, D, and E, and approve variance C. Richard Ludkey, Planning Manager, and Randy Rivera and Chip Tabor are all here to address any question posed by Council. I have no public comment cards or any comments or questions from council hearing none i'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing move to close the public hearing second i have a motion and a second all those in favor of closing the public hearing signify by saying aye aye, aye. all opposed <coughs> public hearing is now closed i will entertain a motion move to approve the ordinance with the exception of no action on variances a b d and e but approve variant c Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Oh, oh wait. Need a city attorney to read. Oh. Just one moment. This is an ordinance of the Louisville City Council amending the zoning ordinance by rezoning an approximately 10.123 acre track of land out of the L. Some help? I don't know how to say that. Survey. Abstract number 52, located on the southwest corner of Rockbrook Drive and East Euchre Lane from Agricultural Open Space District and Light Industrial District Zoning to Plan Development Mixed Use District Zoning, correcting the official zoning map, preserving all other portions of the zoning ordinance, determining that the public interest and general welfare demand the zoning change and amendment therein made, providing for repealer, severability, and a penalty, and declaring an emergency. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. Third public hearing. Consideration of an ordinance granting a zone change request from Light Industrial District to Public Use District on 2.32 acres located on the south side of West Ground Road, approximately 1,400 <coughs> feet east of Edmonds Lane. Fire Station 3 will relocate to this site. PNZ recommended approval by a vote of 7 to 0. The recommendation is that the City Council approve the proposed ordinance as set forth in the caption. Richard Ludkey, Planning Manager, is here to address any questions. I have no public comment cards. Do I have any questions or comments from City Council? Move to close. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor of closing the public hearing signify by saying aye. 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 Public hearing is now closed. I'll entertain a motion. 
move to approve the proposed ordinance. Second. I have a motion and a second. This is an ordinance of the Louisville City Council amending the zoning ordinance by rezoning a 2.328 acre lot legally described as Lot 3, Block A, Texas Instruments Edition, located on the south side of West Round Grove Road, approximately 1,400 feet east of Edmonds Lane, from Light Industrial District Zoning to Public Use District Zoning, correcting the official zoning map, preserving all other portions of the zoning ordinance, determining that the public interest and general welfare demand the zoning change and amendment therein made, providing for repeal of severability and a penalty, and declaring an emergency. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Public hearing number four. Consideration of an ordinance amending section 17-29.5 special use permit regulations <coughs> and section 17-37 amendments. The proposed amendments will revise the language to clarify that special use permits follow the same process as zoning change requests. PNZ recommended approval by a vote of 7-0. The recommendation is that the City Council approve the ordinance amendment as set forth in the caption. Richard Ludke, Planning Manager, is here to address any questions. All right. I have no public comment cards. Are there any questions or comments from Council? Move to close. I've got a motion to close. Second. And a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 <clears throat> All right. Public hearing is now closed. I'll entertain a motion. Move to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second. This is an ordinance of the Louisville City Council amending Chapter 17 Zoning of the Louisville City Code by amending Section 17-29.5 Special Use Permit and Section 17-37 Amendments to clarify the process for amendments to special use permits, providing for repealer effective date and severability and declaring an emergency. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Mr. Ludke, you had an easy evening tonight. All right, next up is the Visitor Citizen Forum. At this time, any person with business before the council not scheduled on the agenda may speak to the council. No formal action can be taken on these items at this meeting. I have Kelly Stokes on behalf of the Children's Advocacy Center to address the council. Great. And Kelly, if you could state your name and address for the record. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, I'm Kelly Stokes. I have an office here in Old Town Louisville at 132 West Main Street, and I reside at 516 Hunter Ridge Road in Coppell, Texas. And um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight, Mayor, City, Council Members, City Staff. Um, I'm here tonight on a different note. I'm here as a board member of the Children's Advocacy Center. I've sat on the board for many years, and personally have been um, a support of the center itself. And I wanted to take this opportunity tonight to really come before council and the city and just really educate you. I know I've spoken to a number of you about this matter and felt like it might be a good opportunity for me just to kind of educate a little bit about the center and a need that we have from the city in regards to the funding of the center. Um, one thing I'd like to point out is how is the children's advocacy, what does the children's advocacy center do and how are we different from other charities in the community? And one big thing of how we're very different is we work directly with the law enforcement, with the police. We work directly with uh, Chief Curvo, and we are a direct arm of extension of the, uh, fulfilling the needs that come into play when sexual abuse happens in our community. And I'll read a little bit of facts here, is that basically we work, as I shared, directly with the law enforcement, and um, we always want to thank them for all the efforts and the towerless, towerless hours that go into having to work such uh, difficult cases as sexual abuse. And um, in addition to the local law enforcement, we also bring together the Children uh, Protective Services, CPS, the District's Attorney's Office, um, a sexual assault nurse examiners, juvenile probation, volunteers, and all of our own staff as well that goes into this. 
And so this multidisciplinary team approach under one roof is one of the reasons for the increase that we've had in conviction rates over the years. And that before the opening of the center back in 1997, this year is actually um, a 20 year anniversary for us, which is a huge milestone. And um, before that, the conviction rate was 8%. And it has risen over the years to 70%, um, including a 73% rate of cases filed by law enforcement just last year. And so you can see that obviously the center has a huge impact on bringing the uh, offenders to, um, to justice. And, but above and beyond that, also servicing those that have been injured by the crime. And I don't know if you know this information, but much of mental illness that we deal with in our community uh, oftentimes goes back to um, sexual abuse as a child. And so you can see that those services are well needed in helping to develop anyone that's been a victim of it into developing themselves into a, um, uh, in, into when they become an adult, being able to fully function and hopefully avoid mental illness um, in the future from that trauma. And so why am I here, okay? <laughs> so I'm here because how we get our funding, and we are very grateful that the city of Louisville has supported us through this CDBG and the funding that we've um, received, we, we use in great efforts, as I've given in the statistics as to what we've been able to accomplish. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to bring as a board member <laughs> is that basically our financial support is that we need to bring, we, we get a lot of support federally, state, but then it takes a lot to run the center and to make an impact. And so what we do is we really look to the surrounding communities to make up about 19% of our budget. And so what we do is we take that 19% and then we see how we're giving out those services from one community to the next. So we see how much are we giving to Louisville, how much are we giving to Flower Mound, how much are we giving to Denton and Corinth. And so being on the board, I have these numbers given to me on a regular basis. And it came as a surprise to me when I looked and I saw that um, Corinth, Denton, Flower Mound, we go to them with our ask and we have 100% support. Whereas really the support that we're getting from the city of Louisville kind of equates more out to about a 15% support from what our request is. And I think part of that is maybe just how budgeting is done. And I think that what we would really like to have the opportunity to do is simply have a council workshop where we could educate you more about what, this, what the services are, how we are directly related to the police um, and what staff is not having to be hired by the city to because of the services that are being offered by the Advocacy Center. So again, I thank you for this time. I know I have a time limit. I probably am going over it. I apologize. And would just want to wrap it up with thank you for the support you have given. And really the ask tonight is to educate and then ask for an opportunity to have a council workshop to potentially educate you more on the need of the center. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Okay, very Appreciate good. It. Hansi, do we have any other uh, public comment? Okay. All right. With that, we will move into the consent agenda. All of the following items on the consent agenda are considered to be self-explanatory by the council and will be enacted with one motion. <clears throat> there will be no separate discussion of these items unless a council member or citizen so requests. For a citizen to request removal of an item, a speaker card must be filled out and submitted to the city secretary. I do not have any cards submitted. I'll entertain a motion. Move to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Item H. Item 11. Consideration of a preliminary plat of Castle Hills Phase 10, Louisville Edition, located on the south side of Windhaven Parkway, north side of FM 544, and west of Josie Lane and three associated variances. The property is being platted for future commercial and residential development. Three variances are being requested. A, to allow a 41-foot street easement 
with an eight-foot sidewalk and utility easement, B, to waive the alley requirement for lots less than 10,000 square feet in area, and C, to allow Block Inn to have a zoning designation of Townhouse 2. PNZ recommended approval by a vote of 7 to 0. The recommendation is that the City Council approve the preliminary plat and three associated variances as set forth in the caption. I have Eddie Collins available to address any questions. Does Council have any questions or comments? With that, I'll entertain a motion to approve. Make a motion to approve with the three requested variances. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. All right. Item 12. Consideration of a resolution nominating one member to the Board of Managers of the Denko Area 911 District. Sue Tremel, Mayor of, Ta Mayor of Town of Copper Canyon, currently represents area municipalities on the Denko Area 911 District Board of Managers. Mayor Tremel's term expires on September 30th, 2017, and she has expressed her desire to serve another term. The recommendation is that the City Council approve the resolution nominating one member to the Board of Managers of the Denko Area 911 District. I'll entertain a motion. Move to approve. Second. All right, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 I just want to clarify your nominating. Nominating. Mayor, nominating. Mayor Timmel. Mayor. Mayor Timmel for the Board of, Board of Managers of the Denko Area 911 District. Are we good with that? Is that good? No. All right. All in favor that. signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Let Mayor Sue know she's back on the board. Item 13. Consideration of declaring vacancies in place number five of the Louisville Parks and Library Development Corporation and place number five of the Louisville Local Government Corporation and consideration of appointment to fill said vacancies. Currently, the only city council members not serving on the 4B are Councilman Daniels and Councilman Jones. The only city council member not serving on the LLGC is Mayor Pro Tem Gilmore. Staff strongly recommends appointing another city council member to fill these vacancies. The recommendation is that the city council declare the vacancies and consider new appointments. All right, why don't we take this in uh, two steps? I'll, I'll entertain a motion regarding the 4B. I'll move to a <clears throat> appoint Councilman Daniel and Jones to the 4B um, Library Parks and Library Development Corporation. We only need one member for the board. I'm sorry. I'm really out. You do. Um, I guess rock paper scissors. Right, I'll do it. <laughs> Councilman Jones just uh, just threw himself. Still low man on the totem pole. I'll take okay, it. so I will throw Councilman Daniels under the uh, under uh, Councilman Jones under the bus. And nominate him. All right. I'll second that. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Hi. I'm Opposed? <laughs> Welcome to 4B. All right. All right. Next we have is the LLGC. I'll entertain a motion. I make a motion to declare the vacancy and uh, nominate Mayor Pro Tem Gilmore to the vacancy. All right. I need a second. Second. All right. Motion to second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. We good? Thank you, Julie. All right, reports. Mr. Ledke. Uh, nothing, sir. All right. You sure? Yeah, I mean, we, get, we gave you a lot of time earlier tonight. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. Keep working through. Chief? Yes, sir. I'd just like to remind everybody that this week we'll be hosting uh, our KTA, our annual KTA event, and this year is our 10th year to be hosting that event. We're really excited that this is our 10th year anniversary and that we've been able to do it that long. Uh, what I would like to do at this time, though, is invite all council members, uh, administrative uh, staff, and directors uh, to our Thursday morning opening ceremonies. Uh, that'll be Thursday, May the 4th, and that'll begin at 8 o'clock. Somewhere between 8 and 8.15 is when the ceremony will actually begin. But if you would like, we'll be serving breakfast at 7 o'clock. We'd love for you to come for that as well and sit down and have breakfast and, and interact with some of the uh, attendees and some of our guys. And then stay for the uh, opening ceremony. Uh, this year's uh, keynote speaker is a, a former FDNY uh, firefighter named Jeff Cool. 
And he was one of the six members of the FDNY that had to jump out of the first story building on a Sunday that became known as Black Sunday in 2005. Unfortunately, of those six that jumped out of that fourth floor window, only two survived. He's one of the two that survived. The other four succumbed to their uh, injuries from that uh, event. Uh, that was in lieu of burning up in the building. They took the chance and jumped and, and hoped for the best. So anyway, he's going to be telling his story. We're really looking forward to hearing that. Um, and then Friday night is our O-Town, uh, KTA O-Town Jam Session uh, in uh, the Wayne Ferguson Plaza. We're really excited about that event as well. That will begin at 6 o'clock in the evening. And we're excited because this is the first year in several years that we'll actually not have any construction going on. So uh, we're, we're looking forward to how that's going to all lay out and look uh, with all the new restaurants and, and, the, and the plaza and everything. So we'd love for you to come out for either one of those events or both if you can make it and fit it into your schedule and look forward to seeing you there. Thank you, Chief. Ms. Booker? Hello. While I'm here tonight, I wanted to let you know that the library is busy preparing for the summer reading program. Uh, this year's theme is Build a Better World, and over the month of May, we'll be visiting uh, Louisville ISD. We have 22 outreach opportunities planned, four of which are for multicultural events, and our bilingual services librarian will be connecting with the community there. So at these opportunities, we'll be doing library card signups, as well as promoting the Summer Reading Club and literacy in general. Super. Thank you. Chief? No, thanks. The uh, lake level just continues to hover right around the uh, conservation pool. But I did want to remind everybody that our watering restrictions, summertime watering restrictions, went into effect today, uh, and watering between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. is restricted during this time. Nothing there? Nothing there? Nothing? Mr. Ferris? No, Thank you, sir. I encourage everybody, we've got one day of early voting left, uh, 7 to 7 tomorrow, and then uh, actual election day is Saturday. So encourage everybody to get out and vote. Jones? Just wanted to take a moment to uh, just reflect and think of the people in Canton, uh, Texas, who went through a lot this weekend. We had our own bid with emergency management, but their, theirs was pretty devastating. Just want them to know our thoughts and prayers are with them and also with uh, Dallas and Fire Rescue, the uh, EMT that was injured today. Absolutely. City Manager? I do not. Councilman? Yes, I believe Mr. Conkey has the uh, MTO grand schedule. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, I do. And you'd think spending half days over there the past week, I'd have been a little more prepared. But we are shorthanded. Uh, there's three things I'd like to tell you about at MCL Grand. Uh, you already, of course, heard about the jam session in the plaza. This weekend also, there are two children's theaters doing multiple performances in the facility at the same time, in fact. There will be Susical the Musical in the Black Box, and there will be Lion King Experience in the Performance Hall. Multiple shows for both. And we encourage people to come out and see that. There are some high-quality performances. In addition, next Saturday the 13th is the next Texas Tunes concert, and our performer is Joe Ely. First time he's performed in Louisville. This is a name that if you are a fan of Texas music, you know his name. I will tell you that as of this morning, we only had about a third of the house left available. Uh, so that's about 100 tickets, actually a little bit less. So if you want to see Joe Ely on the 13th at a bargain price, you ought to get online or, or go visit uh, City Hall and buy your tickets as quickly as you can. All that information, including ticket information, is available at mclgrand.com. City Attorney. City Secretary. Officer Hull, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate your uh, your service and, and of course, uh, by extension, the, the entirety of the department. You all, you all make us proud. Um, did want to let people know of um, May 6th, 7.30 to 4 p.m. at Leela, www.leela.org. That's L-L-E-L-A. Um, from 7.30 to 4 p.m., they have, uh, they're celebrating birds. We have uh, bird banding. We have a bird walk. We have family fun for the little kids to, to interact and, and learn more about birds. Uh, birding basics, if you've ever wanted to know how, the, you, we all have that crazy uncle that's a birder. Um, it's my father-in-law and my family. And, you know, he just, the amazing amount of knowledge. Well, they get started somehow. Well, this is how they do it. They've got a, a birding basics program going on. And we also have a birding by boat. So if you uh, have a kayak or want to get out on the water and see the waterfowl from a little different perspective, 
It's a great day at Leela. It's $5 uh, per car. A couple of these events do require pre-registration, so if you go to leela.org, uh, you can find out. It'd be a great day, and Saturday's supposed to be beautiful. So, With that, uh, we are going to... Uh, Break into closed session in accordance with Texas Government Code Subchapter D, Section 551.072, Real Estate Property Acquisition, and Section 551.087, Economic Development, Deliberation Regarding Economic Development Negotiations. All right, we'll reconvene. Do we have any action to be taken? Move to adjourn. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We're adjourned. Thank you very much. Did we follow exact uh, Robert's rules? I think we're, I think it's Bob's.